Thank you very much, Heather, for the intro introduction. Thank you, Data Innovation Hub, for having me and uh, giving me the opportunity to present the research we are developing in the lab related to artificial intelligence. I, I should um, disclose that this presentation was generated by ChatGPT. All the figures <laughs> were generated by Dolly, so there is nothing original here. You know, probably the only real thing here is like me or, or maybe doubts about it. So. Anyhow, I'll talk about some of the research we are doing um, in our lab. Let me, there we go. Um, with AI, not artificial insemination, and um, how we can leverage um, the development in the area in, into agriculture and livestock systems. Here? Here. Yeah, technology is complicated, right? Yeah. There you go, yeah. So here's the outline for what we're gonna discuss uh, this afternoon. I will briefly talk about what's AI. Um, I always say I don't, wanna, I don't wanna define what's AI, but I'll probably go through what I think uh, involves in these AI systems. Why is that important in their system? Some applications that we are developing, especially related to computer vision systems. So that's the example I pick to discuss today. We are doing more than that in the lab, but mostly, uh, most of the research is, is related to computer vision. So I will show some examples of animal identification, disease detection, behavior monitoring, and some that's not exactly the animal monitoring, but is somehow related that is these headsets that are used for mixed reality, okay? And then we, I have some final considerations about uh, these topics. Okay, so um, I don't think that I need to explain what is AI or how you are using AI because I believe everybody here has a smartphone or, you know, or at least saw one um, in your life. And so if you unlock the screen with your face or with your finger, you already use AI. Congratulations, right? So you're a pro. So we are using computer vision to unlock the screen and using the camera of the device to process this on the edge of the device and give you all these easy to access tools that we find in the apps that are using the phones, right? And so this is an example of computer vision, but in the same phone that we use, you have natural language processing uh, or more sophisticated um, methods to process, for example, voice and text, right? So you can press a button and say, hey, uh, I need to send a message to this person and these all translate to text and you send this. Right? So you have this voice recognition and so on. The kids are very pro in the virtual reality thing, I guess, right? And we can go on and on in robotics and all that involves uh, and it's related to the field of AI. Now, behind the scenes of all this technology, there, is, uh, there are more things happening, right? Especially in terms of data analysis. And so we have uh, more, let's call like, um, major areas associated with machine learning, that's how we teach these systems, right? So when you collect image, if we use supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, self-supervised learning, semi-supervised learning, so there are different ways to teach the system how to learn the patterns, of the, the data that we have, right? So we may have image, and you have for this image, let's say you have an image of a cow, and you wanna measure body condition score, you may have the numbers, the body condition scores evaluated on these cows, and then you teach the model uh, of these algorithms with the image and the label, and this is an example of supervised learning. But you may have only image, and you don't have any information about what is in there, and you want the, the algorithms to figure out what is in the data, right? So that's a, a way that we run unsupervised methods uh, trying to, to teach the system about something, right? And then we have reinforcement learning, which basically when you see this thumbs up and down in everything in the internet and you click thumbs up, you will just uh, doing a positive reinforce for the system that say, okay, your prediction is great and the system will learn with that too, okay? And there are other self and same, my supervisor, I won't comment on that right now, but uh, these are major uh, areas related to the machine learning. And then we go to these specific methods, regression, decision trees, clusters, uh, deep learning, which is becoming actually its own area, right? With several methods within deep learning umbrella and research programs and giant conference about deep learning only, which is now the state of the art for image analysis, um, chat DPT base, uh, it's all based on these type of methods, okay? And then 
this is a very important piece because that's how we interact with this technology. You have in your phone, but these involve hardware, involve cloud computing, edge computing, user interface and experience. And so when you put all this together, that's the simple unlock screen that we have in your phone when you look at that, right? It seems simple, but in the back end, you have all these uh, layers uh, running, okay? Now, the dream uh, in dairy would have something like autopilot, self-driving car to self-drive farms or, or something like this, right? would be nice to have this level of complexity running perfectly with several cameras detecting objects in all different positions and running optimization um, tasks in the back end to say stop, go, turn right, turn left. That is a, a person crossing the street, stop. So there is a lot going on here. And so we should definitely leverage from these systems. Okay? And then recently, these deep generative models uh, that you can put a piece of text asking what you want to do, and these will print pictures. Uh, in this case, I asked, give me three or four cows lying down and one standing and gave me this. I don't know if that, that looks like a cow, but you know, it's closed. <laughs> and then the other one said, like, give me Bucky Badger riding a cow, and it was not exactly what I want, but you know, it gave me something. Okay. Um, and we're going to discuss today that this is pretty cool, but this is not exactly what we're doing in our research program because we have, uh, I would say, maybe more urgent problems to use this type of technology to solve and not only uh, keep creating these, although it's, it's very nice. And then the chat GPT, it's, it's, you know, that's the only slide, if you love chat GPT, enjoy now because that's the only chat GPT slide that I have, okay? So I asked to get my outline uh, here, and actually I didn't print the response, but I said, well, that's a pretty cool outline. And then I said, okay, write a 100 word summary of my talk, and here's the, the summary. In this presentation, we will explore the critical of AI in dairy system. We will delve into various AI applications, including computer vision and modification, disease detection. So pretty cool. And I count the words as like 100 words, which is like sometimes very painful to constrain the summary into these you know, limits. But anyhow, so these are examples of things we are using. And um, there are a lot of discussion actually this week in the Congress, uh, a lot of questions about how these systems will evolve and what type of control these companies should have or how this will be regulated, okay? Again, we have other problems to solve before these get to danger, and we're gonna go now for, for these problems. So, um, one important thing about these systems is that these will deliver a lot of economic return or will you, you affect the econ economy a lot, okay? Mostly by automation and increasing innovation in products that we can create. Okay. And so according to uh, the source, this company that run this study, 13 trillion is expected uh, dollars by 2030 just because of new technology, automation, and increasing efficiency uh, in workplace. Okay. If you look here, labor productivity is probably the most affected area related to the economic impact that we're going to harvest from more and more AI technology um, being developed. Okay. So the estimate is that 326 million jobs will be affected by 2030. And if, if you see the discussion around chat GPT, you probably uh, we admit that uh, it will have an impact in the workforce that we have. Uh, there are some studies already showing improvement in, pro in efficiency in the workplace related to programmers, how they generated much more uh, products uh, using, using the tool. Okay, and uh, this will be affect more jobs, unskilled jobs, uh, compared to skilled jobs. And this is a difficult line to define what is unskilled job or, or a skilled job. But uh, that's that's the total estimate about how this affect. And most of the impact in terms of the economy that AI generates is in China and in the United States. Um, China a little harvesting a little more from this, uh, but then followed by um, United States. Okay, so. What type of systems we have in our farms and we're trying to develop, and just to give you a quick overview about this, um, we have, um, let's call major systems or levels of AI, right? People tend to imagine that AI is all these robot autonomously that can do all these things, but you can have very basic automation system that's based on a computer vision, and there is no human in the loop, it's simple, but it's, it's some, with some degree that is AI involved in it, right? So we have, uh, for example, what we call assisted intelligence. Uh, in this case, we have the human in the loop. Those are, uh, these are very specific systems 
uh, that can help humans to make decisions. So one example here is medical image classification. So you have a training model, you present this image and try to detect or classify levels of breast cancer. Um, in that particular example, this can get um, dynamic in terms of analysis, but in that particular example here, there is no uh, learning or iteration with the system. You present the image and you return what the level or the chance of breast cancer here, right? And so the, we still need a human in the loop to decide uh, what's, what's the diagnosis of, of that. And then we have systems that can adapt. Uh, you see if humans interact with the system, in that case, the recommendation systems that we have, like Netflix, right? You watch the movie, you click, you select the movie, and based on your interaction with the system, the system uh, learn and, and try to recommend what you, you'd like, right? And then you have systems with no human in the loop that's more related to automation. That's probably an old example. Like in car manufacturing industry, you have these arms placing the wheels, placing the doors, and this keep repeating, repeating, repeating with these robots. Um, and there is no human interaction or there is no human in the, that loop. And that's the dream, I guess. Everybody likes to think about this autonomous intelligence that now there is no human. This thing can adapt and can learn and can get better and can get strong and gonna kill us, right? I guess that's a. Uh, that's the discussion right now. Okay, so I don't think we're here um, in dairy or livestock, but uh, maybe we will, okay? The cows will dominate and it'll be a, a big problem. So why you wanna develop these things? Why you wanna leverage these existing technologies, develop some new? Why is that important, right? I guess um, if we talk to everyone, I'm the, on the fourth floor of the Animal Science Building, is that the data people, um, it's that, you know, that floor. And these guys are excited about collecting data to create solutions, data-driven decisions. Some of these guys, they are geneticists. You need to be careful with them. But the other ones, right, Victor, um, are trying to collect that data to create um, decisions. And the problem is, oops, that data that you want to collect is very important, but it's really difficult to collect for what you want to build, OK? Agriculture and I'm talking more about crops when I say agriculture here, it's very advanced or it's ahead of us on how they can integrate data, uh, crop, weather, soil, you know, um, water data. But when you go to livestock, we have this individual here that is moving around, changing farms, you know, uh, leaving the farm, changing groups. And so when we set up this technology, um, it's, it's not that simple to keep track in long term about the animal information and to integrate these with other, um, other data source, okay? And so that's the same for human. Human, you don't have any information. If you wanna ask uh, you know, how the, these employees performing, why these cows never get sick with this employee, we, it's a most impossible uh, question, right? So how can we leverage this technology to collect better data, more data, and then help um, with more data-driven solutions. And the geneticists should be happy too because they need this information because they call these phenotypes and they like millions of these phenotypes. And so if you have technology that can do large scale phenotyping, we can also work with geneticists that uh, will definitely improve animal breeding programs. Um, and this is, is extremely important and I have done this a lot in the department. Okay, so what's our goal then? In our lab, the goal is to optimize farm management decisions. As I mentioned, I, I, I'm using these phenotypes related to nutrition and health. I have collaborations also related to welfare. Um, and that most of the models and infrastructure we are building is to work specifically in this area. Now, this will also help with labor efficiency. And this is definitely important in animal breeding with the geneticists since we have these phenotypes, right? So today, I will show an example, few examples of how, which type of system we are building, which type of system we have in our farm. Uh, a lot of the system installed with the support of the Data Innovation Hub, um, and some also uh, support from USDA, but definitely pretty much the capital equipment. I, I, I had the chance to, to, to ride with Dr. Jennifer Van Hoes. We equip the farm very, very well, and, and the other half of this is coming from USDA. Uh, Funding. Okay. I hope that's not, I think it's my mind already. So, so let's talk about computer vision then. As I said, that's the example. Why um, computer vision? 
Okay, and this is a um, interesting point because most of the research in our lab is on computer vision, but it could be using other sensors. And this, for example, is an accelerometer, right? You can capture motion in the X, Y, and Z dimensions. And here I have two graphs. Here, this graph on the top represents one type of behavior of the animal, and this another behavior. Okay? You can clearly see different patterns. And you have three X, green, blue, and, and red, three dimensions, different motion. If I give you this, what you guys can do with that? Can you build anything useful using these graphs? Or the data that is generating these graphs? Can you? Oh, OK, there you go. But you should do, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the point. You need this, right? You need the label. You need to say, OK, this is data coming. That's a grazing. Uh, this is non-grazing. And if you want to create some tools related to that, you need these labels, right? And so over time, um, if you only have these two variables, that's, that's all you can predict or develop using these if you don't have any other information. Now, if you have a segment of a video like this with grazing and non-grazing, we can do more, right? We can measure the number of steps or develop uh, models to predict the number of steps, bite rate, uh, type of pasture. Here, not only it's not non-grazing, but the animals ruminating, for example. Right? So the information, the power you have in the data here um, is huge when you compare with other technology that we must have the data annotated. Uh, and for sure, here, if you, add, you have more data besides what you can see in the image, it's even better. But the power that we have collecting this type of data is tremendous, especially thinking in the long term. And that's why we have invested a lot uh, in this type of um, systems. Okay? Here, for example, you can count the number of animals, predict the breed maybe, uh, of these animals and um, you know, look at the environment and so on and so forth. Okay, so that being said, and computer vision being, I'm trying to sell this to you, what we have at the farm, uh, it's a very nice system and, and to be honest, I think we have you know, maybe one of the most equipped farms, to not say the most, um, in the US because we have more than 100 cameras installed and it, it's, a, it's a beautiful system that we have there. And so I will show an example of this system that we have with these 3D cameras, okay? This is a deaf camera that is installed at the exit of the milking parlor uh, at our research farm. Here you see two lanes, and you have other two lanes uh, on the left side. And so what this camera can do, it can capture infrared image, like this night vision, grayscale image, can capture deaf image that can give you the distance from where the camera is positioned to the objects in the scene. So for example, here this pixel that's dark blue means that the, the value the, is the distance from the camera to, to the object, so it's closer to the camera. If it's light green, it's far from the camera, right? So using this matrix here, we can reconstruct a 3D image, and so I have a 3D object, 3D object based on this 2D image, okay? Simple, right? So instead of a color that represents a color of the cow, is a measure of the distance from the camera to the object. Okay, so we have this installed, and what happened here, we have an automation system that will be calculating that distance every single second, okay? And imagine that we have a small square that is a virtual square here. So every time the cow is walking, this distance will change, because if it's calculating the distance from the camera to the floor here, and this is three meter, if the cow is passing, then the, the height will change. And so if the height is changing, we acquire a sequence of frames, and it will automatically capture this, this data. Now, the first model we have to train to put in this uh, automation here was a very simple image classifier that will distinguish between a good and a bad image. Because the cow is walking, I don't stop the cow to take the picture, and so I'll have bad images that are images the cow is scrubbing in the image, there is no cow in the image, and so on. So we don't need to process these things, okay? We only need an image that has the entire body of the cow in the picture. So we train a model with thousands of images, and now the model performs very well, selecting what is a good image, and this dramatically reduces the amount of data that I have to process daily. Okay? Then, if I have good images predicted, we call another model uh, that will basically perform an image segmentation, so you remove the background, the pixels, that's not cow body. Okay, and so when we perform this segmentation, 
and remove the background, now I have this, what's called a mask, and so this is a binary file. If I multiply this mask by this image, I get a segmented image uh, you know, for depth and for infrared. So now the image is in a perfect condition for me to process, and I could do different things with this data now. Now, when this cow is walking and the image is captured, all the data goes to the cloud, okay? When the data gets to the cloud, then the system will process model one, model two, model three, model four, and whatever, how many models I have to, to use. This could be body condition score, body weight, biometrics, length, height, could be anything, okay? Getting to this point requires a lot of work, and I have to acknowledge um, Jessica, uh, Mike Peters, Kao's um, IT, um, because to make this system, I need internet, electricity, uh, and, and there is a lot to, to get this going. And so, okay, now I have this ready. I can send an image, and I can do a lot of cool things with that. You probably ask yourself, how you am identifying these cows based on the black and white code call pattern, right? So it's very accurate, actually. Uh, not only our work, our study, but if you go in the literature, you see similar results. Based on this black and white code color pattern, we can recognize individual cows, okay? And the problem is, if I have this, as I increase the number of animals that I wanna classify, I have all black, I have all white, I may have Jersey cows, right? Or black angles, right? Or any solid color, if that's, the right term. So what can we do here? So we published a paper last year, very interesting, using the back, the surface of the cow, the back um, surface, as a measurement, well, to identify the animal without any color information, okay? Just based on the biometrics and the shape of the back of the cow, okay? And so in that case that we did with calves, and the reason is that we, the calves were growing, and we wanna also evaluate if the calf that's growing is changing shape because it's growing, if this would affect uh, the capacity to recognize the animal, okay? And so we were able to have a good results to recognize this group of calves based on the, the shape, the back of the, the, the animal. We use different 3D representation, voxels, point clouds, and what we did, we start skipping weeks and try to identify the same animal as the animal were growing. And we, for the interval max of six weeks, it was a short-term uh, trial, we were able still to recognize the animal reasonably well. Now, we have a project um, um, in collaboration with Dr. Laura Hernandez and Guilherme, Dr. Guilherme Rosa that we are evaluating these animals for one year, two years, three years, and see if we can still recognize the animal, which would be a tremendous in terms of animal traceability and tracking system, no matter what this animal is going uh, to. So um, these images that we collect here, I said there is the infrared, there is this death image, and with the death image, we could, for example, predict body condition score, right? There are dozens of papers in the literature, predicting body condition score with computer vision, with systems like that, and, and that's it's the average accuracy that they found too. Um, so you could definitely use some of this body condition score um, if you are interested on in that, okay? And I'll show you what we are doing different um, in an experiment that we ran that we not use, uh, just not only body condition score, okay? So um, here's the problem that, well, now we have this system built, and we should go for a real trial and try to predict disease or use these um, um, for the capacity that we are trying to, to build, right? And so the problem we are trying to solve here is uh, metabolic disorder, healthy disorder during the transition period. If you don't know what the transition period is, ask Dr. Heather White. If you don't know what that doctor, uh, transition period is, is a three weeks before calving and two weeks post calving, right? Where 67% of the disease happen uh, most in dairy cattle, dairy cows, okay? So it's a very critical period here. And what is particular about that period is that there is um, one thing called negative energy balance that happened after calving, okay? And it's very simple. The cow start to mobilize fat because there is a high demand to produce milk. The cow is not eating enough energy to supply to the demand for energy. And so the cow starts mobilizing body fat reserves, right? And depending on the severity of the mobilization, the cow can get several problems uh, related to 
this periparum disorder, like ketosis, hypocalcemia, retaining placenta, and other uh, issues with reproduction and production, and this will affect actually the overall life of the cow, okay? So, this dam is associated with body tissue mobilization. The cow is changing body shape. Uh, what is the economic loss associated with that? Well, if you look at all these different sources, it can vary from $169 to up to $1,000, right, depending on the level of the disease at that point in the cow. So it's, it's a negative uh, impact and it's a huge economic loss uh, for sure. Now, this loss is related to the treatment costs, reduced productive and reproductive performance, but also increased the cooling. And that's a big problem because if we're investing money in a heifer, $2,000 to raise a heifer, and then the, for this type of reason, you have to cool this animal, then you're throwing money away uh, pretty much. So what's the way to monitor that? One of the ways to monitor that, it's looking body condition score, right? So you don't want the cows to have with high body condition score to fatty because these cows would have a greater chance to mobilize too much fat and get into these problems that I just mentioned. Now, this is not that easy to keep tracking and monitoring uh, in dairy operations, especially if the scale of the operations, it's a large scale, okay? Besides, um, there are some subjectivity associated to what I think is a 2.5 score and what a person thinks that is a 3 and so on. And here is an interesting discussion about this. This is a 2.5, this is a 3 score. We need to agree uh, in the score. And usually you have multiple evaluators to do it. But look this. I have um, multiple evaluators given body condition score 21 days before Kevin, 14 days before Kevin. And they both gave 4 and 4 here. Okay? Three guys here. Same three guys here. Then we collect the 3D image of these cows and we overlay this image perfectly and we saw there's difference in body shape, uh, even if the body condition score is four. So if that's happening, and it's, it will happen at some point because as the cow is transition from 2.5 to three, your eyes cannot say it's, it's in the beat, right? Your problem says 2.5 or three. So this continuous change is really hard to capture with, with visual observation. Right? And so what we want to do here is using this death image to try to account for this mobilization and try to pre predict in that particular uh, trial subclinical ketosis. Right? So this, is, this was a project in collaboration with Dr. Heather White. Um, and I asked her how many samples, blood samples we had to collect to tell if these cows are sick. And she said, like a few thousands. And then, then I talked to the guys in my lab that I used to work with data that they need to go there and collect a few thousand blood samples over a period of a year to enroll this number of cows. And so here, we are using pictures of these cows, death image from 21 days, 14 and seven days before calving. And we are trying to predict a subclinical ketosis event based on the blood that we collected up to 14 days after calving. Okay, so that's, it's already a very difficult task because our last data point will come seven days before Kevin, and if the best case scenario, the, the event, the ketose, subclinical ketosis appear in the day one is still like a week interval between the last data point and the event, right? And so we collect 20, 27,000 uh, 3D image, we measure blood on all these animals pretty much every day, um, and we use this as our gold standard to say this is a sick animal. So what we did here, we, um, we collect this image and we extract features from this image. We have what is called biological features, and that's basically features that we understand, like body volume, body area of the animal, and we assume that, okay, if the volume is changing, that is changing, uh, the animal is changing shape, right? So we collect these features, and we also collect convolution neural network features. So if you remember, that I showed you the classification of the body condition score. We use one of these big uh, neural networks that will extract features from the image that we not always understand what they are, but they are good predictors of something. In this case, the something is the body condition score. But in this particular model, we are not using body condition score. We are interested only on in the features that the, the model is trying to extract that is associated with changes in shape. In that, in that case, is body condition score. So we are using the pre-training model, but not the output of the prediction, okay? So the last layer, called fully connected layer, dense layer, we will extract 1,024 features associated with the body shape, because that's what we're trying to, to predict here. And then, 
in this type of network, the initial layers, we extract very general information related to the animal, or in this case, the edge, the surface of the body, the contours. And then as we get deep in the network, the network will extract very uh, specific features, sometimes related to a piece of the animal, to a, you know, a specific region of the body, uh, that are sometimes hard to identify what is this uh, you know, in, in the whole image. And so lastly, we have this all condensed in a vector, so this uh, become a one-dimensional vector here with 1,024 features, and then we combine these with these three features, and we have 1,027 features to predict um, ketosis. Assuming that this network is learning about the body shape, and this would do a good job predicting. Uh, and then if you look what the, the, the convolutional neural network is putting attention when they're going to classify uh, body condition score, you can see most of the times in the middle of the animal, sometimes in the ramp, um, and sometimes you get these. Um, there is no problem with floor here because the image is segmented, so there is nothing here. This is zero value. But anyhow, we could assess uh, what, what the network is putting attention, and this would be very useful when you start predicting ketosis directly because now the system will be learning how to classify a sick cow and, and directly, not the body condition score, and so you learn where the attention is is going to in the body, and this may inform us um, in terms of the physiology of the cow. So what we found here was very interesting results. Uh, when you use the features extract, we improve a little bit more compared to only using body condition score. We have F1 score of 0.75, recall 0.91, precision 0.65. What that means is 65% of the detected cows got sick, and 91% of the sick cows were early detected. Okay, so we had 35% of misclassification, basically telling the farmer or someone to say, check this cow, but the cow didn't get sick. So in that particular case, the false positives were better because um, it's better checking extra cow than having a, a cow that will get sick and, and this would be more expensive. So what else do we need after that? Uh, we, call, we have the system to, to monitor body shape. What else do we need? Um, for sure, we need capacity building and connectivity to do more, especially related to behavior. And, and that's what uh, we are doing right now. It's expanding to aggregate information. We only have body condition score and this death image, and now what you want to do is collect behavior. Data from the farm system, like parity, uh, previous uh, records, in, in, uh, records in previous lactation, and so on. Okay? And so this is the system I mentioned. We have installed this in both of the farms, and now we, we continue this research, um, integrating more data to it. With that comes a lot of uh, limitation with this large-scale implementation, and the limitation is related to the amount of data that we collect. So this is at Marshfield. We have 29 pens, 29 uh, single board, small computers, very powerful computers, these GPUs. And these are connected to one of these cameras who have 29 of each here. And this is generating a lot of data, 100 terabytes of daily image of these animals at Marshfield. And each camera generates 10.3 gigabytes per day in that particular trial. And so if I want to transfer all the data that I collect from these 29, uh, 29 pens, with the internet we have at Marshfield, it would take me four days and six hours, okay? And so I definitely cannot have any real-time decision that should be in a, in a day, right? Treat this cow, or I mean, it would take four days with the internet connection we have there at this point, okay? So that's definitely something new. The capacity building I mentioned we are building, but the connectivity is something we are, uh, we, we gotta think, especially when you think about deployment that in the field uh, in commercial farms. Well, thinking about that, how we can, I don't have the internet, so what should we do then? So let's compress the data, let's reduce the dimension, right? Let, let, let's, let's keep moving. And so that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, in this trial, we are, we are measuring the body shape or the, the body growth of the animals, we want to estimate body weight. So there are uh, papers showing that we can predict body weight very well uh, using this death in image in beef cattle, in pigs. These are uh, papers uh, from Dr. Guilherme Rosa's group. All the groups uh, in the U.S. already show that. We can use this death image and predict body weight, no problem. The question is, how can you reduce the dimension here? Instead of using this 2D image, we just get this line. This is a vector that we sample in the horizontal dimension and vertical, and we concatenate them. 
And here you can see is like the side view of the animal. And that's here's the back view of the animal. And instead of a 2D image, now I have 936 data points, like just one signal, right? And so can I use this signal to predict body weight? Because this would reduce the size of the data dramatically, okay? And so what, that's what we did. We used these in this type of model that's called out encoder. And what we are trying to do here is reducing the dimension because these type of models will ingest this data as an input and we try to reconstruct the same data. But to do that, we extract relevant features and these are the features we extract and using as a predictor. In this case, 20. So we reduce from these to 936 data points as a one signal and from these to 20 features only, okay? And then when we look to the correlation of these 20 features with body length, body volume, we found interesting correlation, meaning that whatever is being extracted here, which is unsupervised and not giving any information to this model, is associated with the shape of the animal. And then when you compare the predictions using body volume, body length, body area, which we are calling here biological features, they are somehow similar to the autoencoded features. Maybe slightly worse, but very comparable. But what is interesting is that we reduce the dimension of the data from 600 kilobytes to 0.21 kilobytes, right? And so if you think about a dairy farm, with cameras, collecting data, sending data, analyzing data, this is basically what can say it's possible, not possible, okay? And so this is, is, is the type of investigation we also perform in the models in, in terms of predictive ability if we reduce dimension, make it smaller, and make more efficient too. Oops, sorry. And so in the same facility, uh, we are working with behavior. Uh, let me see, no, I think I need to, there you go. Um, we are tracking behavior of these animals and predicting eating time, visit duration, interval between visits, visits. I guess feeding behavior is something very important. Uh, Dr. Luis Ferreira to present um, how this behavior, how these cows can, can play around, uh, you know, and, and this is something we are very into, especially from the perspective of um, 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 health detection because some animals will not visit the feed bank and the dynamic will change and this is extremely important, okay? And in a more large scale, uh, this is a 60 cow group, 12 cameras with the behavior detection and the location detection of these cows, which can allow us to study more the social dynamics of these animals and how they interact and how uh, the whole group uh, moves around. Okay, and and it's uh, it's it's definitely a very uh, exciting uh, step towards investigation into into the mechanisms that are you know, affecting the dynamics related to welfare or with health uh, in the group. And so I think that's the last example I have here in this batch of animal monitoring. It's um, a collaboration that I have. Actually, this, the, the last name of this student is Mantovani, uh, but it's not Ilario Mantovani, it's Ilario's son. Um, that is, we are using image here videos to compute respiration rate. So you can see the flank of this cow going up and down. Maybe from the back you won't be able to see, but it's going up and down. We get the pixel intensity. This uh, is not detected in this cow, but uh, you switch around. So you get the pixel intensity. You have this raw signal. We use Fourier transform, and you get this raw signal into a frequency domain, and then we count the peaks, and then we accurately predict uh, respiration rate uh, using this, okay? And so even if we have data from videos at night, or if you have data from videos in the morning, uh, the predictions were uh, very, very, very good. And, and, the, and the method is, is very, very simple too. So recently, a uh, few months ago, we got this USDA grant, um, and, 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 and I'm very grateful for the Dairy Innovation Hub to have, to, to be the seed for this USDA grant, um, that we wanna investigate other things related to the system we build, related to the economic evaluation, consumer willingness to pay, and build some more extension education programs around AI, how to educate uh, people more about that. Uh, for sure, I won't do these alone, and that's why I have these great collaborators here from our department, Dr. Chuck Nicholson, Dr. Jennifer Van Hoss, and Dr. Victor Cabrera, and a collaborator from the computer science uh, that will help and support us on more the machine learning and analysis. Excellent, so to finish, I think I have still uh, maybe five minutes max. Um, how we can augment human perception using mixed reality. That's more of the future, maybe more related, you know, that's good. But it's, um, but it's interesting. We have this thing called third-person view. When you have cameras around here, 
or if you're looking uh, like I'm looking at you guys. So the, the vision I have, um, it's, well, the, the vision the camera has, uh, it's a third person view when we look to the image, right? Now, there is this thing called first person view that is actually what this person is seeing here. And, and that vision we don't have in the computer vision systems we have, okay? And so we are very curious to, to understand more the interaction of a human and animal uh, from that perspective here, not from the third person view, okay? And so that is all these fancy systems called virtual reality, augmented reality. These are more on the video game uh, that we see with the kids. Now, mixed reality is this uh, headset that you can interact with physical objects, um, real objects, and also uh, um, virtual objects at the same time. And usually use your fingers to interact and click and, and open data. And if, if, you, if you're using this in a farm, and you're checking cows, you probably, I don't know, I, my impression is they won't be doing this a lot because you are busy, the thing is not working, you are wearing gloves, and it won't be uh, maybe that um, efficient. So, but we want to still use it in a different way. I'll show you. So here is Isaiah Hoffman. He is an undergrad in dairy science, and he's milking these cows, and we have this third person view of him, but we cannot see what he's seen here. Now, the mouse is right there. Now, if we turn it on this device and start seeing how he's proceeding, then we have a totally different view, right? We can follow for stripping, wiping the teeth, all these procedures and all these uh, things that should be done during milking time, we, we can have a completely different view that any camera could give us, unless it's like the head of the person, okay? Like this one here, which actually this device carries four cameras, okay? So what we wanna do with this then is we wanna plug the computer vision systems that we have uh, in real time on top of these videos so we can recognize each of these activities, uh, hopefully in real time, not at this point, but we can detect uh, forest stripping, wiping the teeth, all these procedures that should be done, the interval between these procedures and actually check compliance or check or develop a program to train people and that will definitely change people faster. Uh, then you let it go, and then in you know, 15 days you have a bunch of mastitis and problems. Oh, yeah, maybe the training was not great. So you, you could definitely use and leverage this to train people. And augment human perception, which probably would be the most difficult task here, because to do that, we need to run inference in real time and plot on the lanes, come back to this cow. We forgot that. And then you come back. Uh, but, but that's not that simple to be done. But we could definitely track standard protocols and better understand human-animal interactions because some people, we work with the cows in a way the cows will not get sick, and some other people work with cows in a way the cows will get sick. So what they are doing different, that they seem to be doing the same thing, but something is, is, is going on out there, okay? And so that would be an uh, interesting uh, step toward that. So as a summary, I have a few points that I just uh, want to highlight is the importance of this technology is growing more and more. If you like or if you don't like, it, it's growing. I mean, the Congress discussing with these AI companies about the technology they are putting out, uh, it's, it's a clear indication they are concerned about how this is going and this is really going. Um, we should leverage what is developed in our benefit uh, to advance our industry uh, much faster. And I guess it's not only about new questions, as I mentioned with the mixed reality is, is new and, and maybe it's not at the priority. Uh, we have other things to answer first. And we actually definitely have old questions that we just didn't have the capacity to, to answer before. And now with this technology, we, we can definitely tackle that. Um, course related to digital agriculture, certificates, education, training people more in this intersection of data science um, and AI and nutrition, physiology, reproduction, and all these core uh, disciplines is definitely, I would definitely give them ability to, to process data and, 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 and to move forward. With that, I'd like to thank a lot their Innovation Hub for all the support that uh, I've put in my lab and all these other uh, funds like USDA, WARF, and, and, and other uh, sponsors. I am really appreciate the support. And thank you very much for your attention. I'd be glad to answer any question.
animal view, the wearable cameras, body cam, you can see what the what the CMR she's eating, the grass she's getting, the social interaction. Put in the cow, the camera? Yeah. Well that's that would be fun. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. That's uh, I think that's possible from from the hydro perspective. It's possible. You know, the problem is like how we protect these device. Uh, actually, there are uh, some great collaborations that we have with engineering work on the because most of these wearables, the problem is on the battery life, right? And so we develop a lot of research with them on how to the hydro is very cheap we could make, but the problem is how long this will last and to be small enough to be like a camera on the car and that it could track them. But I guess uh, well, there is a, there is a lot of potential. On, on Evaluating these things. Is that is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Body can. Body can. Okay. Yes. Yes. No, that's excellent. Excellent question. Uh, for for a commercial application, I would say you probably keep the minimal. Maybe not keep anything. In our case, is a research lab, so we are keeping every single cent of of data uh, that we can. Especially when we show this, okay, this data compression, we only need this vector, I don't need the image. We keep, we keep all. Uh, it's, it's just like s simulating a farm that the, the person just need the body condition score, the body weight, and that, that's all. And so, yes, so probably would not keep, so you don't have the need to have storage to keep an image and, and, and all the security problems that would have around that. And then the other point is related to if the farm would have to be equipped with this. Well, Maybe f at some level, um, we have a lot of cheap, the hardware is getting very cheap, and we can process a lot of uh, the edge of the computer. So a lot of this hardware can process uh, locally uh, these, and some of these mini GPUs that I showed cost $100, $150. The camera that I showed you cost $120. And so you know, when I saw, okay, $120 plus $100, and a cow that I see costs like $200, I think, you know, I said, like talk to Chuck and Victor. So it seems to me that the, the math here is, is, is now in favor, right? And so, yeah, I, I guess definitely you would have to invest in hydro, but I think it's getting cheaper, it's smaller, and, and this would be feasible more and more. Yes, no, that's definitely, um, when I was as a postdoc, uh, we integrate this data, not from cameras, but from other sensors and try to predict intake. When I became assistant professor, I said, maybe I leave this for when I become full professor, associate professor, after tenure, you know, because this will take my whole four years, five years, right, to, to get done. And no, so I think it's uh, from the phenotypes or from what you have interest, it's probably the most complicated one because of the setup that we have to validate these intake predictions, right? Because these cows are in free stall, sometimes we have electronic engage. And, and so when you place cameras and med, you measure feed disappearance, and you go to the free stall, these cows are throwing feed here and there. And so if you, if you consider using camera to control the feed and the cow and measure what the feed disappearance as a way to predict feed intake, in my opinion, it's a harder task than going to the cameras and all the sensors and combine them to predict feed intake, like using um, you know behavior and, and things that we know that is 
associated with fintech. I, I don't know. I have the feeling that I would, I would go in this route, then trying to um, using the feed pile and feed disappearance as a, as a strategy to predict intake. That that that's my take. I'm not working on this at this moment. I think it's definitely very important. At some point, we will, especially with the capacity that we are building that we can track eating time very well, number of visits, body shape. I guess there is a very important component in dry matter intake related to the animal requirement. And this will be related to size, to fat deposition, to stage of lactation. And I think we can capture a lot of that on the death in image. Um, and so I'm pretty sure if we integrate these, we will be exciting to, to try. Uh, and that's the route I would go as opposed to go to feed piles and, and disappearance of, of feed. No, this is a great question. Actually, you gave me the opportunity to just highlight uh, how, how big this type of data. Sometimes you collect data from 100 cows, and, and then you say, okay, we have 100 data points. Well, we have some thousands, uh, or maybe 100,000 of images, and then if, we, if, if you're gonna count data points, right, each pixel is a data point. So in an image that is 2,000 by 2,000, you know, you multiply 2,000 by 2,000, that's the total number of data points that you have in a single image, and then if you collect 20,000, uh, it's a bunch of data points, right? So what we try to do is to avoid uh, unnecessary high resolution because for some of these networks, the image will be resizing 300 by 300, 200 by 200. And so you collect this huge thing, but at the end of the day, you're compressing a tiny small image like that. And, and, and for some of the applications we have, it's not even necessary, even if, if you have the chance to use a big input or a small input. If you wanna see if the cow is standing online, it can be a small image, it doesn't need to be big. So we try to always think about the farmer in terms of, you know, if this requires too much computational resource to train or to run inference, then it, we need to rethink because we'll never be able, for a research standpoint may be nice, but we'll never be able to implement that, that later. So we, we think about that and we balance that, uh, you know, to, do we need that? Could you use just like one segment? Could you use just like one little square? Right? And, and, and so for the respiration rate, we are sampling the flank area is a square like that size, super tiny, small, few pixels in it. There are papers using the whole image with deep learning, evaluating the whole image change, but what we need is just like the flank change. That, that's the whole thing we need, right? And I think this uh, makes the, we try to make the system more optimized by, by looking at these things. And the, the compression, the out encoders could reduce dimension too. All these strategies could, could help. <laughs> uh, uh, back to the forest floor and the animal science building. So I guess you can decide where you want. But my more serious question, it's kind of a broader question for all of the uh, innovative knowledge generating work we do is there are some questions that are kind of related to how feasible might this be in the future to adopt. One of the things that I think about a lot is uh, what we call as economists scale neutral or uh, not technologies. So Maybe the conversations that we all might have and on the fourth floor for our project might be around, is a technology like this going to really only be applicable on like the largest and most technologically sophisticated farms? Are there benefits for other kinds of 
uh, farms, it, grazing farms that are not going to be in the same kind of climate setting that you're talking about. So thinking about the breadth, the applicability of the technologies is something that maybe all of us can be thinking a little bit more about, but specifically for this. So I don't know if you yeah. have a response to that. But yeah, no, I... Thank you, thank you for, for your, your comment, uh, and I, I have a, a comment about that too. I, I agree with you, I guess. The technology sometimes sounds expensive, right? AI technology, oh wow, this is expensive. The camera is 100 bucks, and you know, the, the Jetson is another 100. And so, the Eastern Tech Gates probably more. Uh, you know, there are all the equipment, super expensive, I scale, right? That we wait, how much is a scale? And you have a $200 camera and Jetson that can predict body weight. So I guess, that's part of the education uh, part and the extension and outreach that we'll be developing is, is, is communicating more about the technology looks fancy, but it's super cheap and it's nothing more than your phone. The difference is like that it's plugged 24 by seven and running this inference, right? And so I, I really believe that most of this technology uh, that requires cheaper cameras and, and cheaper hardware that can run on the edge of the hardware, don't have to use cloud or anything like this, uh, will be feasible. Um, and so maybe not all the AI technology, but uh, some of that I, I mentioned here, I, I have this feeling. We buy these equipment and we know how they cost, and we never optimize them for production because we don't sell these things, right? But if a company is going to manufacture 2,000 of these kits, they may get half of the price and they get even, even cheaper. Um, so anyhow, uh, I think talk, talking about the scalability is, is definitely some of these things won't be easy to scale, some will. Uh, but that's a very important talk, yeah. Okay, let's thank you all one more time. All right, just a few last announcements. So we've got a couple of things for us in the next hour. First, the posters are set up. There's appetizers in there and the chance to use your drink tickets. Uh, so interact with the researchers, the trainees, the students that are by the posters. We also have six flash talks. So these are six brave grad students that wanted to give their poster orally in front of anyone crowding around them. They will be competing for a $1,000 travel scholarship to a conference of their choice. So your blue ticket matters. You get to vote. So it is basically crowd choice here for those six. So that'll start at 4.15. The place to put your blue ticket to vote is, get this, conveniently located where you use your red tickets, just in case you were worried about getting your second drink. So please stick around if you at all can to support those students that are presenting in the flash talks and to vote there. The last thing I'll note is that there will be a survey in the next coming days. It is very brief. I promise I did it. It took me like three seconds. So please share your feedback. Uh, some of the talks will be posted on our website. So we want to know if you plan to look at those, if you think that's useful. We want to know what you liked about today. We're trying some new things. This is only our second symposium. So things like the flash talk are new. Tell us if you enjoyed it. And if you have ideas for the breakout sessions or invited speakers for next year's symposium, Please share those as well because we welcome that feedback. So with that, I know we're all busy, so I appreciate you spending your day with us today. It's great having so many people interested around the same core area in one place all day. So we appreciate your time and your ideas and your networking. Thank you.
Just coming to check the recording here. Yeah, I'm just copying some uh, slideshows off the desktop. Cool, cool. Um, my sheet 